Well, welcome back everybody from spring break. Although if, if you're anything like me, it was one of the strangest spring breaks that you've ever had. So it's over and now it's time to start again. So um, we're talking, we're in chapter three, A Landscape's Fashioned by Water. Uh, and hopefully you've already looked at part one of this lecture. So now we're going to go on to where is this water located on Earth? Uh, this water that uh, is going to carve the surface landscapes that we see and that also is, does geological work underground. Where is this water? Well, Earth is called the water planet. 71% of Earth's surface is covered by water. The oceans, as we all know, contain 97% of Earth's water. Glaciers and ice sheets contain 2% of Earth's water. Lakes, streams, groundwater, atmosphere, which is what we're going to concentrate on in this chapter, streams and groundwater. Look at that number, 0.65% of the water resources that we have on Earth. And the amazing thing is that less than 0.3% of Earth's water is usable by humans. That's pretty stark when you start out with 71% of Earth's surface covered by water, but less than 0.3% is usable by humans. So it makes sense though, when you think about the oceans containing 97% of, of Earth's water, well, they're salty, right? And it takes a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of energy to uh, take that salt out of, of water, out of ocean water. So we might as well say, well, that is, um, unusable to us. Now there are some places that do uh, desalinate water, so there are exceptions to the rules. And then glaciers and ice sheets, well those are in areas where not a lot of people live. Um, very hard to harvest the water in glaciers and ice sheets. So we're talking about streams and lakes and groundwater then, where most of our water comes from. So this is the, the pie chart showing that. If you look at the big slice of the pie, it looks kind of like Pac-Man, doesn't it? If you all know what Pac-Man is. Um, big slice of the pie, that's the ocean water. And it's just that tiny sliver right there that's fresh water. Well, if we start looking at how fresh water is divvied up, here it is ice, 2%. Groundwater, the next largest amount at 0.5%. Well, let's say 0.6%. Rivers, 0.001%, lakes, 0.017%, and atmosphere, 0.0001%. So where does all this water go? It cycles in and out. It cycles throughout all of those um, uh, spheres that we talked about early on, hydrosphere, the lithosphere, the atmosphere. We're not getting any more water on Earth. The amount of water that we have is finite. If you remember how water got to Earth to begin with, it was through collisions when Earth was forming. The collisions of those comets where you had water ice that was locked up in the comets. So that's um, the major way we think that water got to Earth. So we're not getting any more. That old saying that when you take, when you have a glass of water, uh, you drink a glass of water, you're drinking Cleopatra's bath water. That's true. Water just cycles in and out. The same amount cycles in and out of all of these spheres. So we call that the hydrologic cycle. And the components of the hydrologic cycle include evaporation. We've talked about evaporation in the weather section. That's water turning to a, a vapor. Transpiration is the way that plants put water vapor back out into the atmosphere. If you've ever looked at the back of a leaf, you'll see these little tiny holes called stomata, and that's how plants transpire. We as humans, we respire, plants transpire. Condensation, precipitation, now these are all uh, components that we've talked about in the weather section, well except for transpiration, we didn't go into detail on that. Then um, precipitation, infiltration, runoff, these are the ones we're going to concentrate on for this chapter because it's that moisture falling out of the sky, what happens to it. Some of it infiltrates into the ground where it resupplies our groundwater reservoir, 
and some of it runs off in rivers and streams. This is the major, the part that infiltrates into the ground and to resupply our groundwater. That's the part that does work underground and we can get surface expression for that too, like with sinkholes and collapsed caves. Um, but that does the work uh, underground. Runoff is what carves Earth's features on the surface. So here's the, uh, a kind of a real world picture illustrating the hydrologic cycle. And we could enter this at any point. That's why it's called a cycle. But we normally start with evaporation. And we could start with evaporation over the oceans. That looks what, the, uh, what this seems to be. It could be a lake, but evaporation. And then that um, water vapor condenses and we get clouds and those clouds move. And most of the precipitation, most of the evaporation takes place over oceans most of the precipitation falls on land. So precipitation falls, sometimes that gets locked up in storage with glaciers and the snowpack. Uh, the snowpack is our long-term storage for the water that we have here in California in the west in the summertime. Um, so thank you for the snowpack. Then some of that will run off. It's channelized flow into rivers and streams and it'll flow back into the ocean eventually. And then infiltration, this component over here where we have um, water that is infiltrating into the ground. Sometimes we call that percolation into the ground right here. And you see that the water is moving through the rocks until finally it gets to an area that's totally, all the pore spaces of the rocks are saturated. So the top of that saturated zone, we call that the water table. And this water bearing layer of rock then is called an aquifer. We'll talk more about that when we get into the groundwater section. Then um, where the water table intersects the surface, that can give us a lake, that can give us rivers. If you see a river flowing when it's not raining, then you're seeing groundwater flow. You're seeing groundwater, that groundwater that has surface expression because the water table has intersected the surface. Eventually, though, everything will flow back to the ocean. So the hydrologic cycle, again, this uh, water is constantly cycling through all these reservoirs and it will stay different it has different durations that it stays in these reservoirs, and we call that residence time. How long does the water stay in a particular reservoir? So, for example, in the atmosphere, water stay about a week. That's about the longest that water will stay before it rains out. In the ground, it can be thousands of years. It can be tens of thousands of years for the really deeper aquifers. And in uh, glaciers, it can be thousands of years. So precipitation ends up being greater over continents. Evaporation is greater over the oceans, as I stated before. 8,600 cubic miles of water annually flow back to the oceans in rivers and streams. And that's what we want to concentrate on right now. That flow is what gives us some of the you know, magnificent landscapes that we have here on Earth. So the work of a stream, the work of a river stream, I'll use those terms interchangeably. A river's role on earth, what its job is, is to erode, to transport, and to deposit sediments in the most efficient way that it can. I won't say in the shortest way that it can, because sometimes it, you know, takes deep, rivers take deviations, but in the most efficient way that it can on its way back to the ocean. That's a, what a river is trying to do, to flow back to sea level, which is zero feet. So the way it does work can be, depend on the geology of the area. Now, what kind of rock is it? What's the gradient of the, of the land? What's the elevation of the land? And what type of sediment is it carrying? And what time of the year are those sediments coming in? All these things come into play. And a river will change over time in response to these changing characteristics that it has along its path. But they start out as small streams that are fed by melting snow or ice or even rainwater. 
and the small streams will combine with other streams as they flow downhill toward the ocean until the stream gets large enough to be called a river. And that's what we're going to talk about, but let's see how that happens. During a rainstorm, water will initially move downhill in what's called overland flow, or sometimes we refer to that, we refer to that as sheet flow. Now, the best way I can describe this is, is our parking lot when it's raining. You see these sheets of water. If it rains hard enough, there are these sheets of water that are flowing in the parking lot to a drain somewhere, and we have to slog through that you know, to get to our cars or to, to get to class. Same thing happens on forest land, in grassy lands. We have this overland flow. It's just not as obvious as it is to us when, you know, we're in the, a flat parking lot somewhere. But eventually that sheet flow will become concentrated. So if we go back to our parking lot analogy, it's going, that water is going into a drain somewhere and then that drain is going into a ditch line, maybe into a stream, maybe into a canal, but it, it's eventually going to become a channelized flow. And when that happens, we call that stream flow. So overland flow plus stream flow give us runoff. Runoff is a major sculptor of Earth's landscapes. So think about the Sacramento River. When you're seeing that flow in the river, that is the runoff. So drainage basins. Drainage basins are the land area that contributes water to a river system. Drainage basins can be separated from each other by divides, which are like tops of ridges or tops of mountain, uh, mountain tops, the divide that you have. So if you're standing on top of the mountain, you, look, you can look down one side and down the other. Well, that divide separates drainage, separates the water that would be flowing off of the mountain. Uh, and watershed, sometimes these terms are used interchangeably too, and you'll hear me do that. Um, a watershed, it, normally we think of it as a smaller drainage basin, but it just depends on the textbook that you're looking at. It depends on who you're talking to. If somebody's talking about the Sacramento River watershed, well, technically they probably shouldn't say that. It should be water um, a drainage basin, but you know, I'm not going to quibble with it. It's the land area that contributes water to a river, okay? So a smaller one is considered to be a watershed. So like Arcade Creek watershed. All right, so just as I say that, I have a diagram here and the top of it is titled Drainage Basin. And then this line right here uh, is separating one watershed from the other. We could say that it's separating one drainage basin from the other, but a little bit of anatomy here, the anatomy of a drainage basin. Uh, the source, where the water starts, that's called the headwaters. Here's the main channel and where it outlets into another stream or another body of water, that's called the mouth of the stream. Any of these little streams that are contributing water to the main stem of the channel, those are called tributaries. And where you have a tributary that intersects with another tributary or intersects with the main stream, that's called the confluence of the stream. So that's a small drainage basin. Here's the divide right here, the, the stippled line, the dashed line is the water, uh, uh, sorry, is the, the um, drainage divide. And this, on the other hand, is the drainage basin of the Mississippi River. Look how huge this is. There are major rivers themselves that flow into the Mississippi River, like the Ohio River, and there are other major rivers that flow into the Ohio. The Missouri River is a major river, the Arkansas River, the Red Rivers. Um, so this is a huge drainage basin. Think of all the activities that go on in here, all of the, the industrial activity, the farming activity, um, pesticides, uh, water treatment plants, um, you name it, sewage, uh, sewage treated water, that, that or sewage treated water. Uh, sewage that has been treated flowing into, um, into the Mississippi and into these other major streams. 
So that is a huge drainage, drainage basin. Well, this shows you that there are continental divides. So we have two major continental divides here in the US. We have the Appalachian Mountain, which is a continental divide, and we have the Rocky Mountains, which is a continental divide. So water that flows off the east side of the Appalachian Mountains will flow into the Atlantic Ocean. Water that flows off the west side of the Appalachian Mountains will flow into the Gulf of Mexico. Here's the Rocky Mountain Divide. Water that flows off the east side goes into the Gulf of Mexico. Water that flows off the west side goes either into the Gulf of California or into the Pacific Ocean. Well, the Gulf of California is actually a branch of the Pacific Ocean. And then this little unique area right here called the Great Basin. Um, this is where uh, the old saying is rivers go to die. Uh, it's interior drainage and it's hot and dry. So most rivers that flow into this um, end up uh, evaporating away. The Colorado River is an exception. It flows into the Gulf of Mexico. So a little bit of, uh, of or a few definitions here related to stream flow. A stream is a body of water that flows down slope along a clearly defined natural passageway and the channel is what we call that natural passageway. The gradient is the steepness of the, of the stream channel and streams, rivers are going to be steeper near their headwaters than they will be at their mouths. And discharge is the amount of water passing by a point in a certain period of time. And in the U.S., we measure that in cubic feet per second. We'll talk more about this in a second. You're going to have to know the equation and know how to calculate discharge. In the rest of the world, it's cubic meters per second. Load, that's the stuff that's eroded, that the stream has eroded. How is it carrying this stuff? There's a suspended load, there's a dissolved load, and there's a bed load. The suspended load are those smaller sediments, think silt and clay, that are tiny enough to be carried in suspension. And the suspended load will give a river its characteristic color. For example, the Red River in Oklahoma. Why is it red? Because that suspended load that it's carrying is red. The dissolved load is the invisible load because the minerals are dissolved in the water. And when minerals are dissolved in the water, we can't see them. The bed load are the heavier sediments that get carried along the bottom of the stream channel. And they are carried along by the action of the water down there, either sliding them along or sometimes the particles will kind of hop along. Now, the heavier sediments are usually going to be pebbles or maybe even sand, depending on the size of the river. Uh, the let's use the Sacramento River as an example. Right about now, it certainly has clay and silt that it's carrying in suspension, and maybe even some sand. Um, maybe sand is being carried along the bottom of the river. Maybe some pebbles are being carried along the bottom of the river. All that can change at flood stage. What was, carried, what was being carried along the bottom of the river can now be carried in suspension as that flow increases in the river. So it all depends on you know, what the characteristics of the river are, how those characteristics change as to what's going to be suspended and what's going to be bed load. Let me give you another example about this color. If you've been to Discovery Park, that's where the Sacramento River and the American River, that's, here's that word, that's the confluence of the Sacramento and the American Rivers. If you've seen a picture from the air, or maybe you've even been in the water and you see this distinct difference, one of those rivers has a heavy suspended load and it's muddy and murky. The other one isn't, it's clear. And that all, that is determined by the characteristics of the, of the area that these streams are moving through, these rivers are moving through. The American River has its headwaters in the Sierra Nevada. Well, what's in the Sierra Nevada? It's hard granite, harder to erode. Sacramento River has its headwaters near Mount Shasta. 
And if you look at a map showing the way that river flows, it flows all through the valley. And what goes on all through the valley? All kinds of agriculture. So there's all these sediments that the river is picking up. So the Sacramento River is the murky one. The American River is the clearer one. And those, what that means that the water will have different density and they don't wanna mix. That's why they kind of flow side by side for quite a distance before it's moderated. So the gradient is the slope of a river. Maybe you've calculated rise over run in math class. Well, what you were actually calculating was gradient. And a gradient of a river is shown on a longitudinal profile. A longitudinal profile is just a graph showing how the river changes elevation or changes its steepness on its route to the ocean. So the gradient is gonna be steepest at higher elevations and the headwaters where the stream originates, and it will decrease as the river reaches base level. Base level is considered to be the ocean. The ultimate base level is the ocean. Rivers can't erode below the ocean. Then the floodplain is that flat surface adjacent to the channel that floods when the river overflows its banks. Hey, I'll bet that's why it's called floodplain. So let's look at a longitudinal profile. Again, we're thinking about the work of a river. It erodes, it transports, and it deposits. It never stops. Well, unless we dam it up, but it never stops. The gradient is steeper up here in the headwaters, and it will decrease as it flows toward the ocean. Um, so it smooths out its profile. The work of the river is to get that profile smoothed out. We call that a longitudinal profile. Again, over here on the vertical part of the axis, that would be elevation that we are plotting here. And then this would be uh, the horizontal distance that the river is flowing. And this could be 100 miles. We don't have any units here. So it could be 100 miles. It could be 1,000 miles. But every river, when we've plotted, this kind, plotted it on this kind of graph, it will have this kind of profile that we call the longitudinal profile. However, there are areas along the river where there might be these abrupt increases in, in gradient over a short distance. We call those nick points. A nick point could be a waterfall, it could be rapids in a river, but what has happened to create these nick points is that the river has encountered more resistant bedrock. Now remember, given enough time, the river will erode that bedrock. But for the present time, it's having a hard time doing it. So we end up with a waterfall or we end up with, um, with rapids in the, wind, uh, in the river. This is Iceland. And what you're looking at is a beautiful waterfall, but it's also a nick point. Iceland has very young landscapes, so the river has not had time to erode these more resistant rocks down. But the river is not going to stop, and it will eventually do that. Another good example is here. This is Niagara Falls. What you're looking at is the Niagara River, and the Niagara River at the point where the falls are, the rock that the water is flowing over, it's harder. So the river is having a harder time eroding that. Do you think it will eventually? That's the American Falls on the left and the Canadian Falls on the right. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Um, but that rock is um, hard dolomite, so it's having a tough time doing it. But it will eventually, and the eventually is at the rate that it's eroding the rock now. It's thought that in about 50,000 years, it will have eroded that rock away back to um, the point of origin of the river, which is uh, Lake Erie, one of the Great Lakes. And here's a little map showing that. Here's Niagara Falls right here. It's got that much area to go before it gets back to Lake Erie. But it's got nothing else to do. So the discharge of a river is the water volume flowing per unit of time how much water is flowing past a particular area in a certain period of time. 
and the average water velocity, to calculate that, the water velocity is multiplied by a cross-sectional area of the stream. So we would take the width of a stream at a certain area and the depth of the stream at a certain area, and that would give us the cross-sectional area. Feet times feet would be feet squared, and that's area. So how do we measure this discharge? Well, it's getting really sophisticated now. There are these instruments called acoustic Doppler, and it's just something that gets dropped into the water and it measures the water velocity based on the sound frequency shift of moving particles, which is quite sophisticated. Um, back when I was doing this uh, with my students uh, several, many years ago, uh, we used an instrument called a flow meter. We weighed out into the stream and we had this, it was like a pole with a little fan on the bottom of it with a meter attached to it that would measure these clicks as the water moved the little fan blades and it would give us the velocity of the river. So this is a, one of those more sophisticated things. Um, and I had somebody from the Department of Water Resources that was telling me that they can actually uh, calculate the discharge of a river now with satellite. I mean, that was unheard of back when uh, my, I and my students were doing this. Uh, so really sophisticated. You don't even have to get your feet wet anymore to do it. So why is it important to measure discharge? Well, I'm going to look at this from a Western state point of view right now. Water supplies are crucial for lots and lots of different industries, lots of farmers, ranchers, landowners, cities, communities, Native American tribes, because the West is dry. And if we have a river, that's one of the ways that water can be obtained. So back in the 1920s, there was this compact that was signed by Colorado, Wyoming, Utah, Nevada, New Mexico, Arizona, and California on who got rights. It was allocating the amount of water that these particular states could extract from the Colorado River. Everyone, as I say up here, everyone wants their share of the pie. And it's not always a pretty thing because there are lawsuits, uh, Native American tribes got involved in it, there are court cases, Water law in the West is very, very complicated. Um, it used to be first in time, first in line. Uh, what was that saying? The first one that got the water, that's who owned the water. Um, Mark Twain said, whiskey's for drinking, water's for fighting. And in the West, that is certainly true. Think of the 49ers and all the water fights that they had because they wanted water for those cannons that they were using for hydraulic mining. Um, so you have ranchers that want a certain allocation. You want rafting and fishing industries that want their certain allocation because if there's not enough water in, in the river, then you know there's no fish in the river. If there's too much water in the river, you can't raft. If there's not enough water in the ri a river, you can't raft. So they want to make sure that they've got their allocation. Um, and then if we put all that aside, flood mitigation. We have to know what the discharges are in order to know when our flood mitigation measures become necessary. So the West, yes, we measure discharges in all the river, but I don't want to make you think that it's just the West that does it. It's important to know river discharges everywhere. And the USGS, the United States Geological Survey, they have a hydrology unit. There are regional uh, water um, agencies that, that uh, calculate these discharges. Uh, if you go to uh, the USGS website, you can get discharges. If you know what river you want, you can get the discharges for those with no problem. It's very important to know. So how do we calculate discharge then? Okay, first of all, we have to have a flow meter to get our velocity. So I've given you an example here. We've used a flow meter and we measured that that water was flowing 10 feet per second. Then we have to know the width of the river from stream bank to stream bank. And, I've, and with the example here, we've got five feet. And then we know that we want to know the depth of the river. And for our purposes, when 
<clears throat> we were doing when my students and I were doing this, we would do, uh, we would get a depth at three places across the stream and then we would average the depth. But for this one, we're just looking at the deepest part of the stream right here. So we've got three feet. So discharge, which is always Q is what we're solving for, that's the discharge, is equal to the velocity, which is that 10 feet per second, times the area. And the area is going to be the width times the depth. So five feet times three feet. We multiply all those units together, 10 feet per second times 15 feet squared. And for this little example that we have here, the discharge would be 150 cubic feet per second or CFS, cubic feet per second. We just usually abbreviate that CFS, CFS. Okay, so hopefully you understand that. If not, go through it one more time. So there we go, the channel width times the channel depth times the velocity. That's the amount of water that flows by a point in a given period of time. That is discharge. And of course, discharge will change as conditions change. Discharge will be greater toward the mouth of a stream as it gets to these lower elevations because there's more area that's contributing flow to a stream along the way. Uh, the discharge will be less in the headwaters of the stream. Now, if, it's, uh, if we have these um, heavy rains, then the discharges are going to go up. If we get these periods of drought, the discharges will go down. The discharges are usually lower in the summer than they would be in the winter. And this is one of the if you've ever seen a little building sitting by a stream and you wondered what was going on here, there's an, there are instruments in here and that's what's going on. They're measuring the discharge. And a lot of times if you, if you have enough history of a stream and there are these different sections that have been chosen by hydrologists um, as their uh, representative area where they're going to have the width and the depth and they take the discharges, um, then you can, you can um, determine what the discharge is just based on the height of the stream or what they call the stage of the stream. The stage means the same thing as, um, as, as the height of the stream. So you can t determine discharge from that. And you have to have a pretty long historical record to be able to do that. But inside this little house right here, there's um, um, a little weight. There's a little pipe that goes out into the stream. And then there's a weight that will go up and down. And it's attached to an instrument that will measure will go up and down and that way we can determine the stage of the stream and then from the stage of the stream the discharge of the stream can be calculated. So why do we need all this? Well this is the Sacramento Weir. If you've driven across 80 uh, headed west, well it doesn't matter which way that you're headed but it's easier to see if you're going west. When you cross the river if you look to the north you'll see this weird structure on the western side of the, of the river bank. That's this, that's the Sacramento Weir. This was the Sacramento Weir a few years ago when we had a lot of rain um, back at the time that the Oroville Dam uh, spillway broke. And these are gates, all these are individual gates. A lot of times they can be automatically open, but with these they have actually you actually have to have somebody out there opening opening them and they hadn't been open in so long that when they started opening them um, they were rusted shut so it took uh, some effort to get them open so what you're looking at the sacramento river is on the other side of this um, this bridge right here this water is going into the yellow bypass so the, the gates had to be opened up to relieve pressure because the discharge of the river was too high. It had to relieve pressure on the river to protect, to protect uh, life and property downstream. So that was when it first happened. And then this, oh, sorry, I had those, um, those um, pictures transposed. So here you go, there's a road, here are the gates open and you see the water flowing through the, to the bypass which happens to be here. Notice that 
Um, this is, you've got an interstate moving through here, you've got a railroad, you've got major urban area on one side, it's also a wildlife refuge. No houses in here, good thing, uh, but they do grow rice in here. Rice needs water to, to grow. Uh, so this relieves the pressure on the Sacramento River. American River has its own set of, of uh, flood control measures. This is, if you remember the Oroville Dam, maybe some of you were caught in that evacuation when they thought that the dam was going to, was in danger of breaking. This is the spillway, uh, and you can see the discharge coming down the spillway. The discharge was so great that it started eroding the spillway and started undercutting it like that. So this is one of the reasons that knowing what the discharge is becomes so important. There's another view of the water flowing down the spillway. All right, so I'm going to stop there. Uh, we'll get to drainage patterns next time. Again, I will see you back here later. Bye-bye.